Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us to this webinar. I'm, my name is Rachel Kerr, and I'm really delighted to welcome you all virtually to the Department of War Studies. Um, thank you so much for joining us for this event, which is jointly organised and convened by the Centre for Grand Strategy and the um, War Crimes Research Group in the Department. So before we start, I have sort of a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, first, I think your microphones and videos are automatically turned off, but if not, please, please do that. And second is that we'll have some time for Q&A um, at the end after, um, after our speakers have presented. Um, so please post your questions in the Q&A section in the chat um, and we'll pick them up there. So you can post up questions as people are talking and we'll just pick them up at the end um, and, and respond to those. Um, the other, the third thing to note is that we're recording the event. Um, we had um, a lot of people wanting to subscribe to it. So we're recording it and it will be posted on our YouTube channel um, afterwards. So if you want to watch it again or you want to send it to other people or just catch up with it, then, then that will be there. Um, so once again, welcome. We're here to celebrate the launch of Dr. Charlie Lederman's latest book, um, Sharing the Burden, the, Amer the Armenian Genocide and the Anglo-American Struggle to Remake Global Order, which has recently come out with the Oxford University Press. The book presents a fresh new perspective on an event that's etched in the history books and in discussions of genocide and particularly the dangers of ignoring it. So everyone probably knows well Hitler's quote, Hitler's question in August 1939, shortly before invading Poland, who after all speaks today of the annihilation of the Armenians? Well, the answer is that many of us do as it turns out. Um, but whilst it's often invoked, the details of the massacre and the response of the international community such as it existed at the time, is often skirted over. Um, so thankfully, we have Dr. Lederman and Professor Donald Bloxham with us today to explore the details of this particular case and to consider its resonance and its relevance today. And I'm really delighted to be able to introduce both of them. So first of all, Dr. Lederman is a lecturer in international history here in the Department of War Studies. He was previously a Harrington Fellow um, at the University of Texas at Austin, a research fellow at Peterhouse Cambridge, a Fox International Fellow and Smith Richardson Fellow at Yale University, and a fellow at the Klug Center in the Library of Congress. He's also the co-author with Brendan Sims of Donald Trump, The Making of a Worldview, which came out in 2017. And we're also extremely privileged to have one of the leading experts in genocide studies to discuss the book. So Donald Bloxham is Professor of Modern and European History at the University of Edinburgh. He's the author of numerous articles and books on the Holocaust, the Armenian Genocide and the post-Second World War um, war crimes trials, including, I wanted to mention the excellent Genocide on Trial, War Crimes Trials and the Formation of, his of Holocaust History and Memory, which I think is essential reading for anyone interested in the role and function of war crimes trials and the potential dissonance between the legal process and how it's received and understood. So Professor Bloxham's bio also tells us that he's working on two intriguing projects on the role of moral evaluation in the historian's confrontation with the past and exploring the structures and fantasies of destruction in genocide, both of which sound fascinating and I very much hope that we'll be able to invite him back at a later date to discuss one or even both of those. So we'll proceed with the um, presentations. Dr. Lederman is going to speak first about the book for about 30 minutes and then we'll hear from um, Professor Bloxham, and then we'll open up for questions. So, um, Charlie, if you want to get going. Great. Thank you, Rachel. Um, thank you for that kind introduction. And thank you to um, the Grand Strategy Centre and the War Climbs Research Group for hosting this event. Um, I'm particularly delighted that Donald Bloxham, the foremost scholar of the international response to the Armenian Genocide and one of the leading scholars, as, um, as Rachel mentioned, on genocide in general, is, um, is here to, to discuss um, the book and to, to offer his comments. Um, I'm, I'm really delighted that he's here to do that. Um, I, as some of you may know, this book launch was originally planned for March before a combination of the lecturer's strike and COVID-19 rendered that impossible. That seems a long time ago now, particularly as the launch was scheduled for shortly after the US Senate, following on from the House of Representatives, um, voted overwhelmingly to recognize the Armenian Genocide. There are a few issues that have brought about any sort of bipartisan consensus in the US Congress at the moment, but this was one. And with that in mind, I intend to take up the challenge issued by Congress when passing that resolution, which was to encourage education and public understanding 
of the facts of the Armenian genocide, including the American role in the humanitarian relief effort and the relevance of the Armenian genocide to modern day crimes against humanity. So let me just start by sharing my screen so that you can, um, you can see the PowerPoint. Um, specifically, what I'm gonna be talking about today is and trying to explain is why the struggle for survival of one of the world's smallest nations became so entangled in the foreign policies of the two most powerful states, the United States and the British Empire. And in doing so, what I'll try to do is to explore the possibilities, the limitations, and the continued dilemmas of humanitarian intervention today, particularly in US foreign policy. That's not to say that the debates over intervention for the Armenians and the ones that we have today are directly analogous. The past is indeed a foreign country, as LP Hartley said, and they did do things differently then. American interest and security fears were certainly not exactly the same then as those it faces today. But some of the dilemmas that statesmen faced were comparable. And so what I want to do is to discuss a few of them at the end of this talk. It was especially apt that it was Congress that took the lead in recognizing the Armenian genocide and calling for the United States to help prevent these modern day crimes against humanity. For it was around two, 120 years ago that another congressional resolution regarding the Armenians confirmed a fundamental departure in American foreign policy, signaling that the country was becoming a great power with global responsibilities and would no longer remain indifferent to events beyond its continent. The earlier resolutions occurred in the wake of the first large-scale Armenian massacres, which ultimately claimed the lives of roughly 100,000 Armenians between 1894 and 1896, and served as a precursor to the even greater crimes of 1915. The treatment of the Ottoman Armenians was a humanitarian cause celeb at the turn of the 20th century, possibly akin to what we see today with the treatment of the Syrians. Winston Churchill would recall that the Armenians' plight stirred the ire of men and women across the English-speaking world, while future US President Herbert Hoover stated that the name Armenia was at the front of the American mind. But I appreciate that this question might not be at the front of many of your minds. So let me start by giving you a little bit of background on the Armenian question, which was the diplomatic term that arose from the insecurity of the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire. Due to time constraints, this is obviously necessarily a brief overview, and I discuss it in more detail in the book, but I'd also be happy to discuss any of this in more depth during the Q&A. Now, the Armenians have become the first people to embrace Christianity as their state religion in the third century AD, and their faith was strengthened by their claim to also be descended from Noah, whose ark, according to the book of Genesis, landed on Mount Ararat in the heart of the Armenian homeland which you can see here. They had held resolutely to their Christian customs for centuries, but by 1400, most of their territory had fallen under the Ottoman Empire. This was a multi-ethnic and multi-faith polity. And although the Armenians as a Christian minority were second-class citizens, they lived relatively peacefully in their historic home while the empire thrived. But by the end of the 19th century, or certainly um, into the 19th century, the crumbling empire had become the sick man of Europe. It would suffer repeated international humiliations and outside interventions by the European powers, many in support of uprising by the empire's Christian minority subjects. As these nations gained independence, the empire's territory shrunk. And despite attempts at reform, by the late 19th century, it had become increasingly despotic under the rule of the new Sultan Abdul Hamid. Persecution and violence against the empire's remaining Christians, especially the Armenians, whose homelands, as you can see from this map, was at the state's strategic crossroads, increased as the government perceived them as potential fifth columns for European intervention and a barrier to the establishment of a more consolidated Islamic empire. This oppression would culminate in the 1894 Six Massacres, otherwise known as the Hamidian Massacres. When reports of these atrocities filtered into the United States, American humanitarianism initially followed a conventional 19th century practice. Private charities and churches took the lead in marshalling relief efforts. They were led by the American missionary movement, which had been proselytizing in the Ottoman Empire for decades, 
and had established the largest mission field of any nation with Armenians as their principal wards. On the other hand, the federal government declined to involve itself diplomatically in this crisis or to concern itself with addressing its causes. But as public outrage grew, petitions began pouring into Congress, appealing for American action to aid the Armenians. Aware that America was rapidly emerging as a leading industrial nation, and that Congress had recently appropriated funds for new modern warships that would transform the US Navy, many Americans now urged their representatives to use this power to address the greatest humanitarian atrocity of the age. In early 1896, Congress passed resolutions calling for President Grover Cleveland to intervene to help stay the hand of fanaticism and lawless violence in the Ottoman Empire. This was an unprecedented step, the first time that a branch of the US federal government had outlined a political solution to a humanitarian problem occurring outside the Western Hemisphere. Ultimately, this agitation did not lead to executive action beyond sending a couple of those new warships to the Eastern Mediterranean to protect the rights of American missionaries caught up in the cataclysm. But the resolutions revealed that a bold new humanitarian spirit was now infusing American diplomacy. And as calls grew for the US to address the humanitarian problem closer to home, that of Spain's oppression of its colony in Cuba, interventionists justified this by consistently invoking the persecution of Armenians in the Ottoman Empire. This analogy was particularly prominent in the mass circulation newspapers of William Randolph Hearst, who some of you may know was the model for Orson Welles' Citizen Kane in that film. Hearst sensationalized the Cuban issue and contributed to the increasingly belligerent public mood that would help lead to American intervention in 1898. His San Francisco examiner urged Americans to recognize, quote, Cuba is our Armenia and is at our door. Now, one of the major activists for intervention on behalf of the Cubans and the Armenians was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt. Once he became president in 1901, from his bully pulpit, he would articulate a set of principles outlining America's responsibility to intervene in response to what he described as crimes against civilization. The 1894 to six massacres of the Armenians and the failure of any power to prevent them had a profound impact on his thinking. He frequently invoked Armenian suffering as a symbol of man's inhumanity to man and the clearest justification for righteous wars. He referenced the Armenians when protesting anti-Jewish pogroms in Russia and in, and, and in Romania, and also in intervening diplomatically to help bring an end to King Leopold's brutal regime in the Congo. Now, most Americans shared Roosevelt's horror at these atrocities, but some disagreed with how he chose to respond. In the case of his, his protest against the pogroms in Russia, former Secretary of State, the Democrat Richard Olney, laid accusations that Roosevelt's actions were merely a ruse to secure Jewish votes for his re-election in 1904. Imagine, Olney said, the, the tempest of rhetoric if a foreign nation retaliated in kind, to suggest that lynchings in this country were disgracefully frequent and Washington would do well to put a stop to them. Now, obviously, Olney had a point. In 1903, there were 99 recorded lynchings, the overwhelming majority against black Americans. This frenzy of mob executed ritual violence led Mark Twain to label his country the United States of Lynchedom. Twain and Olney were not alone in asking how a nation in which lynchings were rife could brazenly issue other states with protests against their human rights abuses and the paradox is encapsulated in these cartoons. You can see here a, um, a, um, a European cartoon showing Uncle Sam um, shocked at the, um, at the actions of, in what was going on in Russia, while at the same time European shocked at what was going on um, in the American South. And as you can see here, Tsar Nicholas II of Russia weeping at, the, at a lynching in Delaware and refusing to accept a petition about the pogroms in Eastern Europe. So now, as you can see here, this has been sort of gleefully exposed um, in, uh, in the international press, but it was also picked up by um, those nation's diplomats 
And when Roosevelt protested against the pogroms, Russia's ambassador issued his own protest against American lynchings. Now, Roosevelt was uncomfortable with these counter accusations. It hindered America, in his words, from taking the lead on behalf of humanity. And in his 1904 address to Congress, Roosevelt sought to outline a set of principles governing interventions overseas and also justifying why he felt that America could act in this case. And he proclaimed that Americans should prioritize dealing with their own sins, most critically violent race prejudice, over protesting against wrongdoing elsewhere. But in Roosevelt's words, despite America's own very obvious shortcomings, he believed that they had a duty to censure international wrongdoing because it had, on the whole, demonstrated its commitment to principles of civil and religious liberty and orderly freedom. What's more, Roosevelt said, there were occasional crimes committed on so vast a scale and of such peculiar horror that in the extreme cases action may be justifiable. While Roosevelt believes the cases in which America could intervene like it had done in Cuba militarily were necessarily few, it was inevitable that America should desire eagerly to give expression to its horror when it witnessed such systematic and long extended cruelty and oppression of which the Armenians had been victims. As the international human rights lawyer Jeffrey Robertson has pointed out, this is one of the earliest invocations of what, come, what came to be known as um, a, response, a responsibility to intervene or protest against crimes against humanity. This set of principles of intervention, though at the time, didn't make much of an impression on an American audience, but it certainly did abroad, where there was uproar about the possibility of further American action in Europe. Henry Hauser, who was a French author, would characterize this as humanitarian imperialism and warned Europeans that the governance of the world was no longer a matter for them alone. Roosevelt's message raised hopes among Armenians, Jews and their supporters that he would interfere more vigorously on their behalf. After reports of renewed Armenian massacres in 1904, Roosevelt was urged to intervene. But the muted American response to that message that he, um, that he delivered in 1904 chilled his ardour for action. He told an advisor that while he was entirely satisfied to lead a crusade for the Armenians, this was his quote, the country has not the remotest intention of fighting on such an issue. He had tried to rouse Americans, but accepted they had no desire to back up words by deeds. While often eager to protest abuses by other nations, they were reluctant to develop the instruments of power that Roosevelt believed were absolutely essential to make such protests effective. So for the rest of his presidency, he was much more cautious. And whenever anyone asked him to intervene, he invoked a mantra that he had learnt in the American West while as a cowboy, never draw unless you mean to shoot. But even while pursuing this more cautious approach, Roosevelt remained convinced that if the opportunity arose, then the US should intervene for the Armenians. And so when a decade later in 1915, amidst the turmoil of the First World War, reports reached the United States, which was then neutral, the Ottomans were perpetrating new atrocities against their Armenian subjects. The now former president was the most outspoken advocate of intervention. To Roosevelt's disgust, the US official response was characterized by restraint though. Although the American public responded with an impassioned expression of philanthropy to save the survivors, contributing vast sums to one of the largest philanthropic operations in the nation's history, the official US response was limited. President Woodrow Wilson was concerned that public condemnation of one of Germany's principal allies would compromise American neutrality in a conflict that he wished to stay out of. But even after America entered the war in 1917 against Germany and Austria-Hungary, Wilson avoided declaring war on the Ottoman ally. Now this approach appalled Roosevelt. See here on the left, Wilson on the right. Roosevelt publicly declared that the Armenian massacre was the greatest crime of the war and the failure to act against the Ottoman Empire was to condone it. He believed that America was fighting in a common cause with Britain and France and the other allies and not declaring war on all the central powers was a show of bad faith. Above all, 
think Charlie's slightly frozen. We'll perhaps just give him a second or two to come back. Bear with us for a moment. Apologies for this, hopefully we'll be able to get him back in a minute. Let me see. The wonders of modern technology. Yeah. Um, Donald, would you be happy to come in and perhaps give some of your comments on the, the book while we try and get Charlie back? Of course. That'd be all uh, right. Yeah, sure. Do you, do you want to give it one more minute and see, or should I, I come in now? It's fine. Uh, let's give it a couple more oh, of course. seconds and just see. I've just sent him a note, so. I expect he's madly trying to log out and get back in or something, sort out his... Yes, I imagine that's exactly what yeah. happens to me so often. It's the trouble when you think everything's going so smoothly, and suddenly it doesn't. Um. Okay. I think, um, I think Donald, if you don't mind very much, rather than having people hanging on, if you wouldn't mind yeah, uh, of course, of course, um, giving your your comments, and then we'll have to catch Charlie up with them, I guess. But no, that's that fine. Great, that's fine. I um, I, I won't preempt Charlie. I mean, I think what you know, what he was going to go on. I know this because I saw some of his script beforehand. He was, he was going to go on to talk about. The, the nature of, and you'll hear this from him more in detail anyway, the nature of, of the US response during the war itself, which was really to keep up the diplomatic, um, sorry, to keep, keep up the missionary aid element and the sort of informal diplomatic pressure on the Ottoman Empire, but never to declare war on the Ottoman Empire, partly because of the legacy of missionary property and activity there, partly because in some sense relations between the US and the Ottoman Empire hadn't been too bad. The US felt that it was contributing enough to the defeat of the central powers by concentrating on them um, and this was also it's the reason for them being allowed to you know America being allowed to come in and try and administer um, um, kind of articulate the peace afterwards how, even though they're not fought against the Ottoman Empire they've been part of the alliance that led to the downfall of the central powers I see Charlie's back online now um, so I will butt out again Charlie you, the, the last thing that we heard was the sentence ending bad faith Yes, sorry about that. It's a bit like um, you've seen that BBC video of um, of, of, of being interrupted by um, by, by by his daughter um, while, um, while, he, while he was doing an interview. We've had a bit of that in here. Unfortunately, the internet cut out, but we're, we're, we're back. So I'm sorry about that. Um, but yeah, I'll just pick up where I left off. That's okay. Thank you so much for uh, your patience. I'll just uh, bring the. Um, the slide back up but um yes yeah, so roosevelt as i mentioned before um saw this as bad faith towards america's allies and above all he was adamant that if america failed to vindicate the armenians by punishing the ottomans it would reveal all talk guaranteeing the future peace of the world was nothing but insincere claptrap and mischievous nonsense in his colorful phrase but he's motivated by this rival internationalism and a rival humanitarianism to that espoused by wilson what Roosevelt saw was that this, if America was unwilling to make sacrifices on behalf of the Armenians, this compromised any claim that it might have to be the guardian of the highest civilized ideals. Now, true, Roosevelt was out of office and free to advocate policies without any obligation to consider the practicalities. 
but his position reflected a consistent conviction expressed in and out of office that nations must uphold those values by force if necessary when they were challenged. And for Roosevelt, this sense that America would be unwilling to do this was, um, was a violation of that. Now, Wilson had a very different position. He did not conceive of a military solution to, to the Armenian question, and certainly not during the war. The failure of the Allied assault on Gallipoli in 1915 had already underlined the difficulties in invading the Ottoman Empire. So Wilson's prime concern at this time was the defeat of Germany. And unlike Roosevelt, he did not believe that it was America's duty to vindicate the Armenians by declaring war on their oppressors. Now, the principal domestic constituency with interest in the Near East were missionaries, as I mentioned. And they developed a more extensive network in, that, in the empire than any, other, than any other power. By contrast, America's economic interests in the Near East were minimal at this time. Now, the missionaries led the humanitarian relief campaign on behalf of the Armenians and other people in the Near East. And you can see that from these, um, from these remarkable um, um, relief li uh, literature that, um, that they distributed at the time. Now, American missionaries, while administering humanitarian aid, were insistent that the country refrain from declaring war on the Ottomans. They were fearful that the preeminent position that they had developed in the empire over the past century would be jeopardized, and military intervention would threaten American interests and risk worsening the Armenian situation by impeding relief efforts. The missionary determination to remain on friendly terms with the Ottomans ultimately dovetailed nicely with Wilson's belief um, that the US should stay out of the war initially, and then once in, they should keep their eyes on the larger prize. The Ottoman Empire was only relevant as an ally of Germany. And as one critic um, of this policy said at the time, for Wilson and the missionaries at this time, it was not Deutschland über Allers, but Deutschland über Aller. Once Germany was defeated, the threat to world peace would vanish and the Ottoman Empire would collapse. Now, it's not often appreciated that when the US went to war with Germany and Austria-Hungary, it didn't do so with the Ottomans nor that the US was an associated power in the First World War and not an ally. Why was that? Well, above all, and contrary to Roosevelt, Wilson distrusted allied imperialism, and he didn't want the US involved in an allied war for control of the Middle East. This was the principal reason for that hands-off approach. Yet Wilson's apparent inaction in the face of the massacres belies the outsized role that the Armenian question would come to play in his own vision of reforming global politics. At the end of the war, Wilson wanted Americans to take the lead in establishing a reformed international system in which the Ottoman Empire would be dismembered and the security of its subject peoples guaranteed. And in this new order, the US would have a special role to play in Armenia. In addition to urging US membership in the new League of Nations that he outlined at the end of the war, Wilson hoped that it would take on a mandate to help the surviving Armenians to establish their own state. So this was to help what was a nascent Armenian Republic through an international organization establish its security. And Wilson felt that this was a manifestation of his new order, this protectorate. But it was not only Wilson who saw an American mandate in the region as pivotal to a reformed international system. It was also a central tenet of Britain's strategy for the post-war world. So why was that? Well, firstly, the Armenian cause had also enjoyed widespread popular sympathy in Britain, as you can see from this relief literature in the, in, in the British context. Since the 1890s, the Armenians had also um, been a core celeb in Britain. William Gladstone, famous for his advocacy on behalf of Eastern Christians during the so-called Bulgarian horrors of the 1870s, had taken up the Armenian security as his last great political campaign. While the Ottoman Empire had previously been a partisan issue between liberals and conservatives, with the latter determined to maintain close ties with Constantinople as a bulwark against Russia, horror at the Armenian massacres of the 1890s, as well as the changing geopolitical situation with the rise of Germany leading to a much more amicable relationship with Russia, meant that anti-Ottomanism now crossed party lines by the end of the century. And this would only grow during the First World War um, after the Ottomans joined the Central Powers and perpetrated 
the large-scale massacres in the Ottoman Empire that followed the British failure at Gallipoli. This humanitarian sympathy led to a British hope that the United States might take on responsibility for the Armenian state without Britain having to assume responsibility for Armenian security itself. But beyond these humanitarian motives, and more weightily for the British government, these mandates also served British strategic interests, checking France's regional influence and guarding against potential Bolshevist and pan-Islamic threats to the, road, to the road from Egypt to British India, the sort of um, the, the crossroads of British strategic communications for the empire. But the prime motive was summarized by the colonial secretary, Lord Milner, in a meeting of the British cabinet just prior to the peace conference. Milner said that the future of the world depended upon a good understanding between Britain and the US. And in his words, an American mandate was not a mere cloak of annexation, but a bond of union. The idea of an Anglo-American colonial alliance based on US assumption of a mandate is one of the most interesting of the forgotten ideals of the World War I period. It was a cause that the likes of Rudyard Kipling, um, T. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, Winston Churchill, and above all, Prime Minister David Lloyd George worked to achieve at the Paris Peace Conference of 1919 and in its aftermath. What has not previously been appreciated by historians is the significance of the Armenian question for both British and American conceptions of global order in the post-First World War period. Now, Wilson's commitment to assuming a mandate uh, was not this vision, which was the Anglo-American vision of, a, of this colonial alliance, but it was a commitment to a, and a determination for the US to play a hands-on role in establishing a very different form of world order. For, for Wilson, the mandates would provide an American alternative to Europe's imperial practices, and more importantly, ensure that the US assumed a position of global leadership. But as opposition to the League grew, Wilson was forced to subordinate his commitment to Armenian security to winning Senate approval for ratification of the Versailles Treaty and the League. So despite engaging in ideas about an Armenian mandate, and this is a map from the Wilson, Woodrow Wilson papers of the Library of Congress, um, a very different vision of what the Middle East might have turned out like, um, ultimately Wilson um, ended up having to subordinate this to the struggle over, over the League of Nations. Like Wilson, his opponents in the US Senate associated an American protector over the Armenians with that League membership, whereas Wilson perceived it as a symbol of American selflessness and moral power, his opponents interpreted it as evidence of the unrewarding and open-ended commitments the League would impose. Wilson's growing commitment to the Ar Armenian cause, and he sent a number of commissions to the Middle East to sketch out the possibility of a mandate, including this one, and which was led by the American general, James G. Harbold, who, um, who was um, um, the chief of staff for the American Expeditionary Force in Europe and led this idea of what an American mandate would look like. And as you can see here, it's much larger than what is the contemporary Armenian state in the Caucasus. This is an area that covered a large um, sway of the Ottoman Empire, stretching from the Mediterranean in the West to the Black Sea in the East. Wilson's growing commitment to this cause was met by increasing American hostility to international commitments of any kind. So for the Republican leader, Henry Cabot Lodge, and the rest of Wilson's opponents, the US was simply being burdened with what they described as the world's poorhouse, while its former associates in the war, Britain and France, seized the more lucrative oil-rich territories in the Middle East. Wilson's critics claimed it was unconstitutional to tax Americans for altruistic service to other peoples, or to send Americans to what they described as this far-flung plague spot. They summoned up Washington's farewell address and the Monroe Doctrine as evidence that the US should preserve its policy of non-entanglement in the affairs of the old world. And most significantly, they feared that what Wilson was actually just trying to do was to use the mandate as the back door for America's entry into the League of Nations, and they were determined to resist this. Now, this was summed up by the Republican Senator Warren Harding, who succeeded Wilson as president in 1920, and he said, I'm not insensible to the sufferings of Armenia, but I'm thinking of America first. Safety as well as charity begins at home. Now Harding would make this America first message, the first um, sort of narrowly nationalistic conception of this idea of America first, a principal theme of his 1920 campaign. And Wilson's request for an Armenian mandate was a regular point of attack for the Republicans. 
and the debates in Congress reflected the debates in the country at large. And you can um, partly see that with these cartoons. This is the um, this is actually a couple of British cartoons of Wilson as the potential um, new sultan of the Ottoman Empire and the fact that the, um, the Ottoman Turks were waiting for what was going to happen in the Middle East for what the Americans were going to decide whether they were going to join the League of Nations or not, which again points to the significance of this issue. But also you see this in the cartoons in the United States. So for advocates of a mandate, you can see from the cartoon on the left, this was a sense of Congress crying crocodile tears for the Armenians while refusing to do anything to aid them, whereas for opponents, and you can see this in the San Francisco Chronicle, this is JB, John Ball, um, the um, sort of personification of the British Empire, pocketing the more lucrative um, Middle Eastern colonies, um, South African colonies, particularly Mesopotamia, um, Egypt, and giving this sort of meager Armenian mandate to the United States. And what you see throughout these debates is it appeals to America's historic world role, mingling with the desire to limit international responsibilities and refrain from burdensome overseas commitments. And the question of America's duty to Armenia stimulated a public debate over the very character of the American nation. Now, Walter Lippmann, um, a famous American journalist, would sum this up in a New Republic editorial when he said, if we fail at this juncture to vindicate Armenia's right to freedom, then we shall never again persuade the world that our moral sentiments are anything but empty rhetoric playing over a gulf of selfishness and sloth. That was one position. For others, there was a fundamental difference between private expressions of charity and a political commitment to another nation's security. So the Republican election platform in 1920 said, there was no more striking illustration, this is quoting from the platform, of President Wilson's disregard for the lives of American boys or American interests than in his request for an Armenian mandate. Americans should not confuse the humanitarian and material aid that they should extend with the political control that we must avoid. Ultimately, Wilson is unable to convince Americans to join the League and his request to assume a mandate is also rejected. Deprived of protection, Armenian independence is short-lived, crushed between Bolshevik expansion and Turkish nationalism. So where does that leave us? Well, although the United States was unable to prevent the wartime atrocities or to secure Armenia's independence in the aftermath, this should not detract from the importance of the issue during a pivotal period in American history. As American power expanded at the turn of the 20th century, so did the sense that the nation could use this strength to aid oppressed minorities and persecuted people such as the Armenians. Events that would have been lamentable but unresolvable earlier in the 19th century, occurring well beyond American reach, now provoked intense debate over whether the US should respond, and if so, how. Now, this humanitarianism was certainly selective, and the subjects of interest were overwhelmingly religiously based, drawing principally on cultural tropes of civilization and barbarism. And American concern ultimately did not lead to a political commitment, as I mentioned, with official US response limited to relief and rhetoric. But in attempting to convince their fellow countrymen of their responsibility to the Armenians, both Roosevelt and Wilson would extend the parameters of debate on the purpose of American power and the nature of the nation's national interests. Their search for a solution to the Armenian question would encapsulate this internal conflict over America's world role in the early 20th century. Now what I want to conclude by is discussing five dilemmas that would continue to bedevil American policymakers in the decades to come, and indeed right up to the present day that we can see in this response to the Armenian question. So number one, there was the problem of ensuring that presidential rhetoric did not become detached from political realities. And this is summed up most clearly in that Roosevelt dictum, never draw unless you mean to shoot. Now I would say that maxim offers an abiding lesson for statecraft if one often ignored. Yet even while pursuing this more cautious approach, Roosevelt remained convinced that if the opportunity arose, then the US should intervene for the Armenians. And so this illustrates a second competing dilemma of how far a leader should go to reconcile his personal ideals with the electorate's conception of the national interest. During his presidency, Roosevelt publicly promoted the Armenian cause as far as he felt possible, but was ultimately forced to accept 
that despite their sympathies, few Americans believed that action for the Armenians was compatible with American interests. Wilson faced this predicament even more acutely in his attempts to secure the mandate. His opponents pointed it as evidence that the president's internationalism was utterly divorced from any idea of the American national interest and that it was simply designed to benefit other nations at America's expense. The backlash against Wilson's idealism and the reluctance to assume broader international commitments would reflect a pattern that would repeat itself on many other occasions where policy seemed to be guided by excessively utopian thinking. But in responding to the Armenian crisis, Wilson was forced to wrestle with a third important dilemma. This is one that every would-be intervener faces in the wake of a humanitarian atrocity. Either you assume the burden of administering the territory or you force the oppressor to mend his ways. Moreover, having decided that the US should assume that burden, Wilson faced a related fourth dilemma over the legitimate basis for an intervention. Did it require the mandate of an international organization, the League of Nations at that time, the United Nations today, as Wilson proposed, or should it be pursued either unilaterally or with a coalition of willing partners, as Roosevelt insisted? Ultimately, however, all those who worked to resolve the Armenian question for over three decades were confronted with the cruelest dilemma of all, that sometimes it's simply not possible to achieve a good solution. Now, Wilson made sure that he personally never forgot the Armenian tragedy. In November 1917, a delegation of Armenians visited the White House and presented him with a portrait of a young Armenian girl in traditional dress, which you can see here. The girl's haunted expression symbolized the destruction of her nation. In her hand, as you can see, she clasped a mountain snowdrop, a flower whose appearance Armenians regarded as a sign that winter was over and spring was on its way. The Armenians' faith that better days were ahead was captured by the inscription on the painting, L'Esperance, Hope. The portrait was displayed in the White House for the remainder of Wilson's term in office. After leaving office, the former president brought the painting to his new home in Washington, D.C., where it continues to hang over the fireplace in the drawing room to this day, a constant reminder of the tragic question that neither he nor any other American was able to resolve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shelley. That was absolutely fascinating um, insight into, the, into this um, particular episode and in particular the, the sort of mesh of, of, um, of different domestic and international factors that went into all of this and created, um, um, created the story that it did. And I think in particular, um, to me, what stands out is this kind of standoff maybe between principle and pragmatism. And also, if we're thinking about, you know, what's happening now and the debates that are happening at the moment, between this sort of inward facing and the outward facing profiles of liberal states, and that sort of came through strongly in some of your discussions earlier on. Um, I'm going to hand over to Donald now to respond um, and give us his um, his perspectives on the book and his his thoughts on it, um, and then we'll open it up to to some questions after that. So, Donald, please. Thank you very much, Sir Rachel, and um, and thanks, Charlie. I uh, well, I'll begin by saying congratulations. This is, you know, an excellent piece of work, and um, obviously one very close to my own heart. And it's really heartening to see it being given such a solid scholarly treatment. Um, so really, it's a beautifully produced book, it's a beautifully written book. You cover all of the important bases. And um, it's, it's, it, I'm gonna say it's one of those books that's waiting to be written really, or has now been written. It, it's, it seems, it's, it's, it's a peculiarity of this field, I think. Um, you, know, you mentioned the rhetoric of, or the nomenclature of the Armenian question. <clears throat> tied in as it was to the Eastern question, you know, that, that old sore of European politics, but also of European historiography. It's been really interesting to notice in the last 20 years or so, the way in which um, an older historiographical obsession, you know, diplomatic, straightforward diplomatic historiographical interest in the end of the Ottoman Empire, the arbitration of its um, successor territories, has been uh, reinvented through the prism of 
humanitarian <clears throat> and genocide studies perspectives, both of those somehow united quite closely. Um, so we've got a really interesting new angle on quite an old topic, if, if you like. Um, and that has been really a very fruitful addition to um, um, to the canon of, of, of you know, some of the historiographical backdrop to contemporary issues. Um, obviously, you're joining a few other people who've worked roughly on or on similar areas. Davide Rodonio and um, and Gary Bass spring to mind. Although you've got a, obviously a very your own unique focus and, and, and dealt with the Armenian question in far more depth than either of those scholars did. There's no accident, of course, that all of your focuses are on the Ottoman Empire. And there are very good reasons for that. We might, um, there are two reasons for that really, aren't there? One of what we call the strategic interest, and one in inverted commas, perhaps, and this is something I'll ask you to tease out a bit later on, but let's call it the humanitarian interest. Um, strategically, the Ottoman Empire is so important for the other great European powers because it's, it's, it's part of the great power system in some sense. Um, and in that sense, thoroughly enmeshed within great power politics and the concern about what happens as it declines and potentially falls is a huge element, huge preoccupation of European elites in, in the other states in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. Um, the other aspect is its cultural difference or that strange blend whereby you have its, in terms of its leadership and um, the dominant elements of the population. Uh, religiously different, significantly culturally different leaderships, the leaderships of the other great powers, and within the Ottoman Empire itself, the hierarchy with, with Muslim populations at the top and Christian populations lower down. And um, so it's got these, these sort of twin, on one hand, kind of thoroughly tied into the European power system at a strategic level and as a kind of strategic problem. On the other hand, these special elements um, of, I don't know what you would call it really, cultural, ethno-religious concern, uh, which tie in very, heavily to the humanitarian element um, there. Um, such that generally when we see what we might call humanitarian concerns being raised, they, they tend to pertain primarily to Christians. Um, a, I'll come back to this later at the end in, in, in one question towards the end. It's not exclusively true. I mean, I, I think one thing that would be really interesting to see someone draw out actually these days, maybe it would make a good master's um, dissertation topic or even a PhD topic is, the brief kind of fling with the interest of the fate of Muslims in the aftermath of the Crimean War with the, um, you know, as the Russians you know, drive through and consolidate rule in the Crimea and the North Caucasus uh, at the expense of the Circassian peoples. A whole bunch of different peoples cast under that kind of common nomenclature. And the extent to which there is a brief um, pro circassian movement moment in, in Britain in the 1860s. Uh, interesting because many of these Cassians are Muslims, some are still Christian, some are animist. Uh, nevertheless, it kind of breaks out of that kind of uh, that sort of nexus of the humanitarian, pro humanitarian, and also being pro Christian at, at this stage. Well, I think one might merit study, but on the whole, um, the humanitarian interest is in Christians, and that gives a, a specific slant to it Christians within the Ottoman Empire. But when we think about these two, on the whole, you know, the, the actions of so many of the European powers, including Russia and that, you know, are guided by the intersection of these two elements, the strategic element about managing the decline, or and in some cases hastening, or in some other cases trying to forestall or, you know, delay the decline of the Ottoman Empire, um, and the fate of Christians specifically within it. Those are the two kind of sort of central issues, really, managing the so-called Eastern question. Um, and it seems to me that here's where you know your project is really interesting and really sort of brings out something important. Uh, well, one of the many areas of that. Um, if you say take Britain, but I think the same is broadly true of other countries. If you take Britain too, um, on the whole, it's got the strategic issue and the humanitarian issue. And for those people who are in power, rather than those people outside power criticizing those in power, for those people in power, it's generally a question of how you get the humanitarian concerns such as they are to fit into your broader strategic concerns. So you've got the strategic concerns there. You try to make the, you know, you try to make the humanitarian consideration fit that. If it doesn't, well, sod it. Um, would be, you know, broadly the, um, the scholarly way of summarising the situation. Now, with the Americans, it's, it's oddly different, isn't it? I mean, this is, this is a peculiarity of the Wilsonian moment in, after the First World War where that you've got these <laughs> this measure which is whatever we call it sort of cultural 
ethno-religious or religious humanitarian whatever that box of box of things and it's you know he, he does try to dress it up as being a strategic benefit in some way but it's it's minimally strategic in terms of at least in terms of the kind of history of what i might think of as the cynicism of great power endeavor in that region um it's minimally strategic and sort of maximally kind of whatever you might use that it's um maximally charitable in some sense right uh, or expressive of a value rather than an interest um which is of course as you rightly intimate in the book what the one reason it never gets off the ground <laughs> um but it's very interesting for that you know the amount of the, the amount of work that goes into trying to sell an idea which is you know principally being sold on its value basis rather than its interest basis is is, is really kind of remarkable really um and it leads me to ask, i mean I, I suppose i want to ask two questions of it based on some of those kind of lineages coming out of of um the fact that we have this remarkable sort of value-based concern you know however different however one might assess it in all sorts of ways um which then collapses um but you sort of you imply you know quite rightly and very reasonably some some afterlives for all sorts of these questions and one of the afterlives is of course the relationship between this um what we see in the late ottoman empire specifically with the american agenda there or the wilsonian agenda and you know latter-day humanitarian intervention in strategically significant areas of which you can think of think of a number um you make the move at some point very consciously you know you, and you intimate the difficulty of this in, in you know, but i want to draw out more you know how do you get from the kind of basically pro-christian thing which is about saving lives that also have to be christian lives to the more general humanitarian thing that tends to inform rhetoric today so you see at what point is that does one morph into the other or is one sort of piece of rhetoric consciously cut off at some point and replaced by another one What's the nexus between those two things? Um, we might call this the sort of inverted Circassian question, if you like. The other question, um, if this is okay, is, 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 is to think about, I mean, it's a peculiarity, isn't it? When, when so much of the, you know, the Armenian sort of, I don't know what you call it, nationalist concerns in the aftermath of 1915 and 1918 was with mandatory Armenia, an independent Armenian state significantly housed in part of eastern anatolia um and that became for a long time the, the yardstick by which you measured america and the armenian question to the extent of people agreed or didn't agree with the mandate idea and it seems to me that there are other ways in addition to that or separate to the mandate idea that, that have some sort of humanitarian valence and these perhaps you don't touch on quite so much in the book and maybe you'd like to expand upon them now if you can because i'm thinking for instance I mean, clearly, if you're looking at the historiography or the, the history of um, great external great powers in the Ottoman Empire, the, the powers that have by far the most responsibility for well, meddling in the Ottoman Empire and partly exacerbating the dynamic between Armenian Christians and Ottoman Muslims and between Armenian nationalists and the Ottoman leadership are, are the European powers, really, principally Britain and Russia, but by no means only them. Um, you know, if we're talking about kind of historical responsibilities, these are the guys with the responsibilities to sort it out. If any, if any external power had such a responsibility, right? America coming in, then ultimately not taking the mandate, probably not that surprising. And there's in, in, in a sense, any sense of a just historical responsibility, you know, these guys are probably not the ones who, you know, deserve the burden <laughs> if it was a burden to be taken up. The um but when the mandate, it's not just a question, is it, of the mandate getting rejected. So when the mandates, uh, the idea of the mandate's rejected, there's still this question of how American officials, businessmen comport themselves vis-a-vis -vis the Ottoman Empire. And tied into that, irrespective of the mandate or no, are issues of, of humanitarian purport, specifically the question of you know, what happens to those remaining Christians still in the Ottoman Empire during the Greco-Turkish Wars or that rump of Greek and Armenian Christians that stay in the empire even after the Lausanne population exchange. Um, and then also subsequently matters of the uh, Turkish state's relationship to its Kurdish people, which is not, not on the horizon yet in terms of Western diplomacy. And in that sense, over and above the kind of not simply not the US, not Congress and large, you know, uh, the American public to a certain extent turning away from the, 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 the man, supposed mandate responsibility, which they 
obviously do. There's this additional effort, how they then kind of cope with the humanitarian legacy in, in, in Turkey on a separate kind of ordinary everyday diplomatic level. And at that level, it's not just a kind of not taking on the burden. It's a very conscious kind of attempt to insinuate the way that people are hiding to the ambassador's group. These guys are actually very, very pro-Turkish nationalists. Really, in the writings and the end of the time, you know, selling the new, the new nationalist, kind of purified nationalist to the American public as a kind of best opportunity as a strategic partner. There's, so we move on to a kind of, like, very, I don't even call it out, very conscious thing. But you've also an awful lot of propagandistic downplaying of what happened in the Armenians in 1915 as a way of kind of selling to the whole American people the reset relations. And that seems to be a film full of the incestive political approach. And I kind of, the way in which these guys parlay circled American uh, moral authority to be entirely simplified as music. I've never talked about the Armenians again, or any other simplified as music. They can sell any authority they might have in the interest of an ultimate failed attempt to slow them to take out the trade, and a whole bunch of other attempts to sort of rebuild the branches. They can't make any difference in the musical theory. They can take you all to the open and submerge them. And they're going to be able to ask you for time in any case with the true doctrine, obviously. But that legacy kind of association with the state really paid off um, in American politics. No, probably haven't anyway, because it's become a new origin. It's just all about that kind of the way in which, you know, actually, and that's separate to the mandate, there's this other strand of kind of, you know, through the hard and cool administrations, the kind of more specific use of what phraseology to use just to navigate between idealism and realism, saying realism jumps down in. In not having a mandate. There's something else going on there over and above that. Just a rule note. Just talk about that for a minute. Um, what's that? I guess I'm looking at what's done. Now, the first book done is like really most important and best in the audit. And you know, Sterling's relations with the piece of work, and it's a, a really impressive thing. You can see around. I'll just bear to you. That's a which I'm virtually sharing with you. So, from virtually sharing, I'll just say what benefits. So, we're very nice to be there in, in person and I'll have a few words. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm very much. Thank you. 
um, government and British policy during this time and how that impacts Africa and Africa as well. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm glad that the, uh, thank you for those questions, great questions. And I pick up on this idea of similarities. And I was struck that I came to this topic because those were the issues that I found that I was interested in and I wanted to go back. And obviously, you, you try to you go back into the history, you try to, to, to approach it with the, with the questions. You can't avoid, I suppose, approaching the questions of the present. You try and at least leave your present disappears and avoid them. Get them. But I think it is the case, they are very similar. Um, a part of things that I think is very interesting is that the, so the Samantha Power writes her, um, her, her book, The Political Bias Pamphlet, on the Armenian Genocide. She starts with the Armenian Genocide, it comes up to the 1990s. Um, it's an extremely powerful book. But I think my sense was that the lessons that she took from that weren't necessarily the responsibility of the We've seen the issues that she faced. I mean, it's, it's an amazing sort of case study, an intellectual being faced with the very issues that she studied. And she comes into the Obama administration and um, is in the United States administration, first in Libya when she was uh, on the National Security Council and then in Syria. And I think what, the question, what we see in that book is a sense to which the United States almost turned a blind eye to genocide in that early era. And I think that's the only question. It isn't the case that the US has turned a blind eye to genocide. And I think we see from these dilemmas and, and from the sort of history how much Americans grapple with what you do in the face of this. And I think that's the that's 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 coming up again and again. So my sense is, I'm glad that Fabi mentioned they're similar sort of dilemmas. I, mean, I think those are the questions that. that and I'm sure there's more, and these are just ones that, that spring to mind. It's not just about with, with dilemma, this isn't just about ignoring, or, I mean, these are extremely hard pressing questions of statecraft, and it's not just simply a question of being able to either ignore or militarily intervene. It's a uh, completely down from that. But I think the most important thing that comes out of this is that the issues don't go away. And we tend to think um, when we enter a period, and no one's mentioned this previously, but American foreign policy particularly goes in cycles. And it's something that happens as a roadmap that says, well, we need to retreat from the world. And I think the United States is a unique geopolitical position, so much more a secure geopolitical position in terms of what was previously called free security. Um, and um, it, it's not it's not so basic hostile rivals on its um, on its doorstep. And so there's a sense that the United States can feel um, that it can sort of retreat from the world to a certain extent. And I think the thing is it's not right, not right, is because even at the time we have an administration that has, that has, that has done that, we're still seeing some sort of language over over right. We're seeing this Hong Kong today with a uh, with diplomatic and that's also back on the United States as well. So again, I mentioned mentioned your point previously, this, uh, this question of, um, of liberalism both home and abroad. And the sort of debate for Roosevelt, um the sort of thing that we the Cold War in the United States was condemning um, um Soviet treatment of, of its population, particularly Jewish population, but the counter accusation was look at segregation in the South, look at look at the brutality of the system, look at the um, China's comments on um, the protest. So this this thing section between geopolitical and domestic, I think it's not going to go away. And it's, and it's, and it's, it's a fundamental question we're just going to have to keep getting to grips with. So the question, back again, um, from Garrick Zouin. Throughout the, 19th, the, sorry, the 1890s, conservative British Prime Ministers, Gladstone, the Earl of Rosebery, and even the leader of the Conservative Party, Lord Salisbury, was the most successful in Turkey. Yet none of them used coercion to ensure that Sultan Abdul Hamid carried out the reforms that were set out in the Cyprus Convention. I was wondering whether their back off was mainly due to the lack of British national interest in the Middle East, partly to a perilous political situation and strong resentment from the continent of Europe, particularly Russia and Germany. Can I back that to you, Charlie? To, to yes, but, um, it's a great question. It's something which is talked about in quite a detail. There is a shift um, in Britain in the 19th century, and I think there's, there's an irony throughout the 19th century with some for geopolitical reasons, because of concern of the continent of Europe, and because of the concern of civil disability, and because of the concern with Russia in particular. But by the 1890s, it's a bit freer to take a um, more independent position. But at that point, it's a passage to the United you were mentioning previously Rachel, about the similarities with Britain. I think some of these questions that Britain faces as a power in the 1890s, as a power in relative decline, facing um, powers around the world that were improved in the 19th century from a more multipolar system um, at the turn of the century. Um, and we see very um, similar things today with the United States facing some rising powers. And again, sort of some of these questions, there's a, there's a sense to which we're well, facing sort of um, the uprising in South Africa with war, but it's facing sort of questions in Central Asia, it's facing um, um, a complex social change. It has a global picture of its interest. As a result, even though there's sort of this large sort of humanitarian outpouring um, in, in, of the Armenians, there's still a sense that as powerful as Britain is, by this point, and it's probably influence events on the ground in the Indian Empire without the support of the other European powers. And ultimately, they can't do that because the other European powers are not willing to allow it to do so. So, we see to the present day where, um, where, where the United States is potentially less um, capable of influencing um, events on the ground um, in the region than it, than it, than it possibly was to do Thanks. Do you have anything to add on? on oh, well, I agree with you know, the Cyprus Convention and the Cyprus Convention. The protections of the Armenians, the only paper of protections, as we've been there, quantities. From the British perspective, is to remove any kind of prior or special exposed Russian or proprietary of the Armenian question as established or laid claim to by the Russians in the 18th century with its protection from the British regime. The British regime wants regimes, rigorous regimes, protection of the Armenians in the Indian Empire. I hope that Russians continue with consolidating the victory in the Afghanistan battle. What changes can the British regime do now? Because as soon as you've got that, up and running. Um, the land groups in the area through the Britain, so it's, it's still a matter of some difference between the Papyrus and the Papyrus. And so at that point, British actually feels much more freer to criticize the Ottoman Empire, although still not committing any kind of political reform. And partly because the metric grounds are partly because they see that Germany is increasingly successful in the 1890s, and it's anyway keeps trying to um, more, you know, push the relationship with the Ottoman Empire, especially to serve all the political relations inside the first institution. So you get a situation somewhat like somewhat analogous to German Ottoman relations, a situation where there's no Ottoman relations in the first world war, where they're finding out the British government of the Ottoman Empire, being very proactive in looking after Armenian Britain. Uh, but the Germans make very sharp vision, as does the, as the Americans do in the First World War, the missionary humanitarians on one hand, the diplomatic pressure on the other. Um, and that's their way into the Ottoman Empire. Really, so one of their ways into the Ottoman Empire is the Ottoman Empire. Because it's not something that's sovereignty. It's a sovereign territory. In a way, they haven't really been in Russia. It's a sovereign territory by talking about the British forcing the Ottoman Empire to reform the Armenians. But they've never really written, you know, what's that written now in law? It's just a kind of excuse to keep the Russians out of it. It's the Herzog. They've never really written. It's a very interesting British perspective. They've never written. 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 Thank you. Um, we've got another question, I suppose, about four again for now. Um, so it's, the genocide is still carrying on
it's, 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 it's you look at and I think there's a number of uh, I think part of the reason why the um, bill goes to Congress and it does um, is because of what was going on on the Syrian Turkish border um, and the of, of Christians, uh, particularly those who um, so the Kurds obviously was, was, was a major humanitarian concern, but also a sense to which um, Christians who sort of fled from um, their ancestral homes and fled in the first world war during the first world war, um, that we were seeing sort of many of these sort of um, the sort of um, people, um, their ancestors were now uh, sorry, their descendants were now um, facing a situation on the Syrian border um, with uh, after President Trump's withdrawal and uh, the sort of Turkish incursion into Syria. So, in the American sense, there was a um, there was sort of an, an analogy. It was being brought up in the in the next um, book election. But I mean, I, it, I mean, I, having just given an answer, I've talked about how these issues continue to be live issues, and, and, and I have no doubt they will continue to be live issues. I mean, at the moment, in terms of bandwidth, what, I mean, these questions are just not. Um, in a world where where COVID nineteen is, um, is is dominating, but also just just questions about the internal um, um, stability of the amount of, of, of America. These questions, particularly what's going on in the Middle East, are just um, are not really are not live concerns for American policymakers, and I don't think will be for some time. So um, we'll, we'll see. And I, that, it will be interesting to watch that on sort of the international consciousness. And I never say never on this, but I certainly think until November, there's there's very little chance of um, of much American diplomatic um, sorry, activism in the region. Um, in, in, in the near future, that would, that would be my sense. I don't know if Donald has anything to add on that. I think Donald might slightly have frozen for a second. I've got a few more questions in the, in the Q&A, so why don't I just pick those two up? We don't have, we only have sort of just over five minutes yes. left now. Um, so I'll, I'll read those out and then, and then back to you, Charlie, and then I might just quickly add on the next um, so Andrews asked, you discussed the ebb and flow, I think you said seesaw, of US attitudes to humanitarian intervention. How closely is this flux mirrored in the similar changes in attitude to non-humanitarian intervention, Vietnam, Iraq? And the question, Oliver Smith, um, hi, Charlie, thank you for a great talk. What do you think were the key longer term lessons for the fledgling Anglo American alliance arising from the handling of the Armenian question, i.e., questions that policymakers were drawing on in 1950? Um, and then I was just going to ask you to ask both of you, actually, if, if Donald um, comes back again before the end, um, a question about kind of what, where would you go next? I mean, I love these kind of um, Armenia is a hidden history, and we all sort of out and excavated the detail of it in, in, such, a, in such a sort of ripped way. Um, I wonder where you would go next if you were going to. Write another book on another instance of humanitarian intervention that we can, you know, that has some references that we can cut into the past of different countries that do just things differently there. But yeah, sometimes they do things the same, sometimes they do things differently, and there's a lot that we can we can learn. So kind of where where would you go next year in thinking about if we're talking to MA and BA students, what would be the topic that you might um, might explore? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I'll take the first one from Simon um, first. Um, but I think the, I think that's it's really important. I think we, we do I think I think um, one of the um, analysts of, of American foreign policy, um, uh, D.W. Bogan, who was um, a British scholar, um, talked about this idea of the illusion of American omnipotence. Um, and I think we see that, and the sense to which, um, what he talked about the illusion of omnipotence, he said it can lead to the sense that if America can't get to the world, then um, it, it's the consequence of falls and aids. It's not to do with anything the United States has done. And I think we see that over the long ago of Korea in the 1950s, I think it also applies to the Vietnam War. There's a sense to which, at that time, so much of the time, the United States is so extremely powerful. There's a sense to which, if it's um, in terms of achieving its objective, uh, because it's so powerful that it should be able to shape the world um, as it saw um, as it's best. Um, and I think what we see is, the is where the limitations of that um, come to um, um, We saw this in the aftermath of the Korean War, and we've seen that in the aftermath of the Vietnam War as well, the Vietnam Syndrome, as it, as it comes to be called. Um, there's a sense to which that we, we see these ways. This, 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 the opposite of of idealism, um, but, but I just sense of potency in the United States um, can shape things in a way they can't. I think there's a turning inwards, and there's a sense to which those leaders who, who, um, who have not made a difference. So that must be my first um, answer on that. Um, on second, on the key lesson to the American lines, I think that's a really, really good question. Um, you see, I think, I think there's a sense to which a number of people, yeah, British, um, Campaign to bring the United States in. Certainly, James Bryce, who's probably the foremost British scholar of, um, of American democracy in that period, who just rails against the idea that the British and the president and president believe this is going to lead to this American role in the world. It's essentially the British politics has not understood the American constitutional system or what motivates America. I think the person who I think is most interesting in this, one that emerges after this, um, in a sense, um, um, as, as, as war secretary during this period, in a sense to which um, there's been he wants to draw down British troops in the region and in reliance on the American mandate to help do that. Um, he doesn't lose his, um, his sense of faith in, in the belief in this sort of English speaking commission, but he is certainly more wary privately about how you bring the United States into the United States. He Philip Kerr. So, Philip Kerr is Lord George's sort of chief advisor, probably one of the sort of intellectual architect of the mandate policy, who, um, who, who believe, believes it's trying to be a British Empire and move from the British Empire to a more Commonwealth system, and the British military is too bogged down in the Middle East because other nations help govern the world, is the expression that he uses. And Kerr goes on to become the British ambassador to the Civil War. And I think we see the lessons that he learns from this about how you um, bring American public opinion around to take on this larger international role. So, I think he does have a large legacy for British policymakers as well as the And I'm going to go back to next. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm completely away from this on my next. I'm working on a book um, again with them, um, with Ben Sims, on the five days between Pearl Harbor and the declaration of war and the international history and the international period. So I'm just signing out the loop as a result of that on the, the, um, the literature on humanitarian intervention. I think, as Donald mentioned, I think there's, there's so much in the 19th century that hasn't been, um, hasn't been, 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 hasn't been
where he would go next in terms of picking the next. He was going to buy another book on the industry. What would he pick? Maybe I don't know if I can ask you some questions just before we finish up. Whether there's one sort of episode that you think, you know, for prospective PhD students or for doing a main BA dissertation, what? Oh, well, well, it's a tough one. I mean, I, I, um, it's a lot of time since I worked on it.